Where did the low-carb approach as a means of beating diabetes come from? Who were the men or women who pioneered this approach as a way of driving your blood glucose down into the normal levels? Today, we'll take a look at the history of the one man who is arguably the father of the modern low-carb diet as an approach for beating diabetes. Some of you who've been helped by me to get your blood glucose down may have assumed that I'm just a new guy who's appeared with my own new ideas about diabetes and blood sugar. But the truth is, I'm simply following in the footsteps of a number of brilliant doctors and researchers who knew these things long before I ever did. But who was the first? I'm not sure that anybody would ever be able to answer that question. We could talk about Robert Atkins, or we could go back all the way to the early 20th century and discuss some of the doctors who were encouraging the reduction or elimination of starches and sweets. Or we could go all the way back into the 1800s and look at William Banting, who wrote a pamphlet that became hugely popular, where he recommended a diet minus starches and sweets for weight loss. But many of these guys were far more concerned with weight loss than they were with diabetes. In this video, I want to talk about a man who essentially pioneered the low-carb approach specifically for diabetes. And the reason he was so focused on diabetes was that he was a diabetic himself. In fact, a type 1 diabetic. I'm talking about Dr. Richard Bernstein, to whom the diabetic world owes an enormous debt. Today, I want to look at where he got his ideas and the roots and the foundation of his low-carb approach to diabetes, which has become a worldwide phenomenon today. Richard Bernstein became a type 1 diabetic in 1946, a long time ago, at the age of 12. In those days, type 1 diabetes was a terrible affliction that would almost certainly shorten one's life by several decades at a minimum. The fact that he is still alive today and practicing medicine at the age of 85 is a pretty powerful testimony to the effectiveness of his methods of diabetic control. After his diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, Richard spent the next 22 years doing what the doctors instructed him and having blood sugar soaring sky high and then dropping so low he could barely function. His doctors put him on a high-carb, low-fat diet which virtually guaranteed monstrous fluctuations in his blood sugar. He took insulin, of course, as a type 1, but it could not possibly keep up with all the carbs that he was eating. Plus, there was no way he could precisely match his insulin dosage with the high-carb meals that he was eating. His blood sugar highs and lows took a terrible toll on him. He developed serious kidney disease, frozen shoulders, and infections of all kinds. He was constantly taking antibiotics to deal with the infections. He had night blindness so bad that when he entered a movie theater, he'd have to sit in the nearest chair for up to half an hour, just waiting for his vision to adjust to the darkness after which he could finally walk down to the middle section and actually see the seats. Bernstein's growth was stunted, and he never achieved either the height or weight of the boys and later the men who were his age. Try as he might, he could never get any heavier than 115 pounds. His life changed, and indeed the life of many diabetics who've been helped by him since then, including myself when he saw an advertisement for a blood sugar meter in the back of a medical magazine. Now, Bernstein wasn't a doctor yet at this time, but he had subscribed to this magazine when he had worked as a medical supplier of hospitals. Until then, the only way to know your blood glucose levels was to go to the doctor and have him take your blood and send it off to a laboratory. But in this magazine, there was an ad for a machine which could test your blood on the spot and within one minute tell you what your glucose levels were. Richard was fascinated, and he wondered if this machine could help him with some of his diabetic woes. The problem was that it wasn't available to the general public, and it was sold only to doctors and hospitals. 
However, Richard was married at this point and his wife just happened to be a doctor. Using her stationery with her permission, he ordered the three pound blood sugar testing machine for the price of $650, which is over 4,000 US dollars in today's money. When it arrived, he immediately put it to use, testing himself over and over again. He wanted to know what raises blood sugar, how does insulin lower blood sugar, and by how much. His most urgent concern was to see if this device, this ancient ancestor of our modern little Mike the blood sugar meter, could help him stop these terrible diabetic complications. For three years, he tested and tested and tested himself and seemed to make almost no improvement. His physical problems showed no signs of letting up, he gained no weight, and there was no indication that for all his testing he was really doing himself any good. But at this point, he had not yet seen the need to truly normalize his blood sugar. He had been assuming that he could fix most of his diabetic problems through exercise, and he had lifted weights like crazy but it made no difference in anything. But everything changed when, as he researched diabetes, he saw an article which suggested that tests in animals revealed that diabetic complications had been prevented and sometimes reversed, not through exercise, but through bringing their blood sugars into the normal range. This possibility was thrilling to young Bernstein. If it worked in animals, could it not work in humans? He talked to his doctors who threw cold water on his query and told him that humans were not animals and furthermore it was, in their minds, impossible to get a diabetic's blood sugar, and especially a type 1 diabetic, into the normal range. But Richard Bernstein had a bit of the rebel in him, as most folks do who beat diabetes. He wanted to find out for himself whether this could personally work in his own life. He wrote, since I had been trained as an engineer, not as a physician, I knew nothing of such impossibilities. And since I was desperate, I had no choice but to pretend I was an animal. Over the next year, he tested himself more and more and made various adjustments to his diet. He says, if a change brought an improvement, I'd retain it. If it made the blood sugar worse, I'd discard it. I discovered that one gram of carbohydrate raised my blood sugar by five milligrams per deciliter, and one half unit of the old beef pork insulin lowered it by 15 milligrams per deciliter. Within one year, he had his answer. By constant testing and making changes in his diet based on his tests, within a year he had his blood glucose down into the normal range. No more crazy highs, no more scary lows, just beautiful, normal, stable blood sugar. He had cut his necessary insulin by two-thirds, and many of his diabetic complications reversed themselves, and those that remained did not get worse. Bernstein wrote, I had the new sensation of being the boss of my own metabolic state, and began to feel the same sense of accomplishment and reward I had in engineering. When I solved a difficult problem, I had taught myself how to make my blood sugar levels whatever I wanted them to be and was no longer on the roller coaster. Things were under my control. Bernstein had found an answer to his own diabetic woes using an ancient ancestor of Mike the Meter, and as he read diabetic magazines, he found it very strange that the virtually unanimous opinion of the doctors of his day was that, number one, it's impossible for diabetics to achieve normal blood sugar, and two, even if it were possible, it was definitely not desirable, and any attempt to do that would cause more harm than good. Bernstein writes, How was it that I, an engineer, had figured out how to do what was impossible for medical professionals? The eating plan he'd worked out was simple. Cut the carbs so low that you could precisely determine how much insulin it would take to cover those carbs, and then take the necessary and appropriate insulin. In practice, this worked out to be about 30 grams of carbs per day. For his breakfast, he would limit his carbs to 6 grams. For lunch and dinner, he would allow himself 12 grams of carbs per meal. By knowing exactly how many grams of carbohydrate he was dealing with, 
and determining just how low a unit of insulin would take his blood sugar and just how high a gram of carb would raise his blood sugar, he could match the carbs in his meals with the fast-acting insulin he took before the meals. Additionally, he took slow-acting insulin a couple of times each day. Bernstein's success made him euphoric. He had to tell the whole world. He naively assumed that all the medical world would be thrilled right along with him at this new approach to type 1 diabetes and that soon diabetics all over the world would be using his new method. But to his surprise, no doctor and no medical expert seemed to be the least bit interested in what he had to say. Number one, he was not a doctor, so what could he possibly tell them? And second, everybody already knew that diabetics could not possibly achieve normal blood sugar and that it was both foolish and dangerous to even try. A third argument was that testing their own blood sugar was something that no diabetics would have the least interest in doing. Who ever heard of a diabetic patient acting as their own laboratory? In time, Richard realized that he would never get the respect he needed to publicize his method of dealing with diabetes unless he himself became a doctor. If you can't beat him, join him. And so, at the age of 45, he went to medical school and became a doctor, specializing in the treatment of diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. Since then, he's written numerous books with the two famous diabetic classics, Diabetes Solution and Diabetes Type 2. Between his own medical practice and his books, his YouTube channel, his lectures, and other means, Dr. Richard Bernstein has probably helped more people to overcome diabetes than any other single person alive today. I ran across Richard Bernstein in an indirect fashion. When I was struggling terribly with runaway blood sugar, I first found someone who stated that a vegetarian, meatless diet would help me conquer diabetes. He seemed to make some sense, and so I cut meat out of my diet. As a result, I ate more carbs than before, and my blood sugar fluctuations seemed to grow ten times worse. Finally, in desperation, I read a book by a lady named Margaret Blackstone who told of how she conquered diabetes. It turned out she was a patient of Richard Bernstein, who had informed her that she had to shave her carbohydrates very low. She did that and found victory. But as I read her book, I was confused and upset. I'd been sure that the answer was in a relatively high-carb, meatless diet. And now here I was reading that the answer was in a low-carb diet without worrying about meat. All I knew for sure was that my vegetarian diet was surely not working for me at all. So I figured I didn't have much to lose. And as I cut my carbs, I began to do what Dr. Richard Bernstein had done so many years earlier. I was blessed to have a meter that didn't cost me over $4,000. In fact, those early meters I used cost me about $20, and the strips were usually about $20 for 50 strips. It did not take long at all for me to recognize that Bernstein was right, and the vegetarian approach, at least the high-carb vegetarian approach that I'd been using, was wrong. I quickly saw exactly what Richard Bernstein saw, which was something nobody can really contradict. Carbs raise blood sugar much faster and higher than protein, and fat hardly raises blood sugar at all. And as I tested and modified my diet, what happened to Richard Bernstein happened to me. I went from crazy extremes in my glucose levels to stable and close to normal blood sugar. Now, he was type 1, and I was potentially a type 2, but it was working for me. And as I became more and more careful in keeping my glucose under control, irritable bowel syndrome left me, frozen shoulders stopped, and my A1Cs became close to normal. So, there you have it. As Paul Harvey might have said it, now you know the rest of the story. Strangely, after all these years, much of the medical establishment is still recommending the same worn-out, high-carb, high-spiking diet, which has never worked. I found it almost funny that on a website describing Dr. Bernstein's diet, it listed the pros and the cons of the diet. And one of the cons they listed was this. 
runs contrary to dietary guidelines for managing diabetes endorsed by major medical organizations. But things are changing, and the work that Dr. Bernstein has done and is still doing at the age of 85 at this time is doing a world of good and producing all kinds of little miniature Richard Bernsteins, and I'm proud to be one of them. I'll put a link to Bernstein's two major books, which you can purchase on Amazon, and also a link to his YouTube channel. Learn of this man, get his books, watch his videos, and be inspired. Now, the story I've been sharing with you and Dr. Bernstein's direct quotes have come from his book, Diabetes Solution. It would be worth the price of this book just for that one chapter alone, but it has far more good stuff than that, so I'd encourage you to get that book if you can. That's it for now. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up so that YouTube will rank it higher in its search engine and more diabetics will get to see it. And consider subscribing to this channel so you can get more helpful information about diabetes and how to defeat this monster, which seems so terrifying, but in fact, can be beaten with a little wisdom and the grace of God. God bless, and see you again soon.